encouragement in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The wonderful name of, in Hebrew, Yeshua, in English, Jesus. And we're going to talk about uh, the Hebrew names because there's meaning to his name. And in the Bible, the meaning of names is very important. And so we're going to talk about that. First of all, let's look at this passage. Uh, Psalm 148, verse 13 says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Now, in uh, the New King James and, and many English translations, it says the name of the Lord. But in the Hebrew, that's not exactly what it says. And that's following a tradition of the Jewish people to when the name of God is written to say Adonai there, which is a title. And sometimes in the scriptures, it, it calls God Adonai as a title, and uh, that's in the scripture. But sometimes it's, it's uh, a, uh, a substitution. They're saying it in place of the personal name of God. And so sometimes in the scriptures, we'll talk about this, there will be Adonai and the name of God. And so, uh, so that's why sometimes in scriptures you'll see the Lord God. Because it would, as we'll talk about, it'll be kind of clunky to say uh, Adonai, Adonai. But because they're uh, uh, replacing his personal name out of fear, they don't want to misuse it. And so the best way to not take the name of the Lord in vain is to not say it or write it in, the, in some way of thinking. But it's written many times in the Bible, and God calls us to say it. He, calls, he wants his name to actually be known. So let's look uh, here. Here's the, def, here's the um, um, from the Greek Dictionary. This is showing you what the word is actually uh, there in the Hebrew. yod he vav he And in English would be the equivalent letters of Y-H-V-H. And the pronunciation would be Yehovah. So in that psalm, let's back up to that slide. Let them praise the name of Yehovah is what it actually says in the scripture. But we're, they're, they're saying Adonai, which means Lord, in the place of his name. Also, during the time, uh, this, this rule started to come into place uh, a couple hundred years before Christ. And this was also during the time when the Greek Empire was uh, oppressing the Jews, and the Jews revolted uh, with the Maccabees. And then we have the miracle of Hanukkah where the oil continued to, to fuel and burn the menorah for uh, many days when it only had enough for one day until they could make more oil. And so they were forbidden uh, in that time to say the name. And, uh, but then the Jews also made a, a, a practice of not saying the name. And so uh, that's why uh, our English Bibles follow that tradition of uh, saying Lord, which is the meaning of Adonai, because the name, the proper name of God, the personal name of God would be uh, replaced by saying Adonai. So I'm just pointing that out to you that uh, because Lord is really kind of a title, God is a title. But he actually has a name. And what he's actually saying here in the psalm is, let them praise the name of Yehovah. And for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. All right, let's go on to, let's look at Proverbs 18.10. You may be familiar with this passage. We, we sing about this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. But again, where you see Lord, that's not what we see in the Hebrew text. 
That's a substitution of Adonai in place of his personal name. So what it really says is the name of Yehovah is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And so uh, if you have a uh, Hebrew Bible and uh, if you have an interlinear or if you, ha you get into a uh, program, you can pull that up. And so here's what this word is in the actual text of Proverbs here. Again, it's... Uh, what we call the tetragrammaton, which means four letters, of Yehovah. And that is the proper name of the God of Israel. And so in Old Testament times, a name was not only what people called you, but it had meaning, and it was identification. It was an identity that would be in the name. And so often a special meaning was, so names were very important in the Bible and in those days, uh, a special meaning was attached to the names, and names uh, had an explanatory purpose. There's an uh, uh, instance, and we can see this in many places in the Bible where the name is, uh, and the meaning is explained in the text even. But when uh, King David was dealing with a man named Nabal and his, uh, his wife Abigail, you know, he'd come and he'd sent men asking for food from Nabal, from, so asking for hospitality, and Nabal said, get lost. I'm not helping you. I'm not giving you anything. And uh, he made uh, David angry. And so Abigail said, uh, Nabal, whose name means fool, he, she says he is as his name. For his name, as his name is, so is he, Abigail says, and this is his wife. <laughs> Nabal is his name and folly is with him. In other words, his name means foolishness and he is a fool. <laughs> and so throughout scripture, God reveals himself to us through his names. And he uses, uh, in, in conjunction with his his one personal proper name. He uses different titles. Uh, there are different names like El Shaddai or El, uh, but the proper name of God is also compounded with other Hebrew words that reveals who he is to us, to those he is in covenant with. And so they're called his compound redemptive names. And so when we study these names that God has revealed to us in his word, we'll better understand who God really is. The meanings behind God's name reveal his personality and nature of the one who bears that name. And of course, Jesus told us to pray, hallowed be your name. Speaking of God, right? Speaking of the Father. And so to hallow a thing is to make it holy or to set it apart to be exalted as being worthy of absolute devotion. To hallow the name of God is to regard him with complete devotion and loving admiration. God's name is of utmost importance. And uh, what the Jews would always say is that God and his name are both holy, are both one. And so we should never take his name lightly but always rejoice in it and think deeply upon its true meaning. So let's read this passage out of Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 5. It says, And the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabania, Sherebiah, Hodija, Shabania, and Pathahia said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. Now, again, what is, what is in the text here? Uh, well, in English, but in the Hebrew, you alone are Yehovah. It's his name. And so it's the one name that God gives us that distinguishes him from anyone else called God. Okay? 
You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord God. This is now is Adonai Yehovah. You are Adonai, Lord, Yehovah. That's why here it says, Lord God. And so the reason I bring that out is because Lord God is not as personal. You need to realize that what's really written here, what, the, uh, what Nehemiah really is saying, and what God is saying is he's speaking through Nehemiah, that, uh, and he's calling him, you are Adonai, and it's proper to call God Adonai. That's why it was used as a substitution, because sometimes uh, it's used of him. But I want, I want you to know that he's saying, you are Adonai Yehovah. And so to avoid being clunky, saying you are Adonai Adonai, they translate the second uh, substitution Adonai as God. So sometimes... Uh, it can be translated, Yehovah can be translated as Lord, or it can be translated as God, especially when it's used with Adonai right before it. So Yehovah is Adonai, which means Lord, Creator, uh, but he's, he's, he's speaking to hit God with his personal name. You are Adonai Yehovah who chose Abram. Now remember, if you know the story of Abram who became Abraham, his name was very important. And God changed his name, and God changes names throughout the Bible. At different times, he also changed Abraham's wife's name and Peter's name. Yes, yes. So in our, our weekly uh, Torah portion, yeah. So it, it's very important what the name is. In fact, Revelation says he has a name that he's the only one that knows, and he has a name for you. Cool. So you are Adonai Yehovah who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham, father of many nations. And that changed Abram's identity to Abraham, and it changed how Abram saw himself. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites. By the way, who does that land belong to? The descendants of Abraham, Israel. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, and the, and the uh, Termites. <laughs> to give it to his descendants, right? So who does it still belong to? God gave it to his descendants, so it still belongs to them. You have performed your words because you are righteous. In fact, uh, Christine preached recently, the Lord, our righteousness, one of the redemptive compound names that he compounds his personal name with, Yehovah, uh, Sidkenu. It's, it's put together in a compound name. And when we start, we're going to explain even some of the meaning in Yehovah, and uh, when you add another name with it, it, it multiplies the meaning of what God is going to do in his relationship to you. The Lord, our righteousness. Mm. So, uh, now the Jews understood this because one of the Ten Commandments is you were to honor this name. You were not to misuse it. You were not to take it in vain. And so we can, let's read this, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And so 
uh, it's, it's definitely right to never use his name as like a swear word for sure. But the meaning here is even deeper than that. You could also, it, and, and involved in the Hebrew meaning here is to kidnap his name. You shall not take his name and apply it and say you're doing something in the name of God that is contrary to him. Like, for example, you couldn't say, oh, I'm aborting babies in the name of God because God told me to do that. No, he didn't. That would be to steal his name. So when people uh, say that they're doing God's work and, and uh, saying that uh, God told them to do that or they, they're doing it in the name of God, which, by the way, uh, a radical Islamic terrorist will say, uh, and the name of their God is not Yehovah, it's Allah, not the same person. But they'll say, Allahu Akbar. And what they're, when they're killing people, they're saying that they're doing it in the name of God. So when we do something and you say you're doing it in the name of God, when it comes to the real God, it, it should be something that God has authorized you to do. If you do it and say you're doing it in his name, but he didn't authorize you to do it, then you're stealing his name. Wow. Let's see also in Leviticus chapter 22, verse 31. Therefore, you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am the Lord. Now, you're, 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 I hope you, now you're getting the, the picture. If we look at the Hebrew here, he's saying, I am Yehovah. If we look at the, the, the text in Hebrew. And so we have a, a Adonai here substituted because of the danger. Because uh, So Jewish people didn't want to risk taking his name in vain. So they didn't want to say it or, or even read it. So they would substitute Adonai here. But I want you to know that what God is saying, he's not, God isn't saying I am Lord. He's saying I am Yehovah. He's, he's saying to you his name when he says this. I am Yehovah. You shall not profane my holy name. Which the, the, the title Lord isn't that holy name. See, if we just read this in English, we might think, that the thing that he's telling you not to profane is the title Lord. But that's not what he said is his holy name that you shouldn't profane. What you shouldn't profane is Yehovah. And of course, if you, if you use the title Lord about him, uh, again, you shouldn't defile that either uh, or profane that either. You shall not profane my holy name but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Again, I am Yehovah who sanctifies you. So it's more than 6,000 times in the Old Testament that we have the personal name of God actually written. Okay? So it's very often. So there's a lot of lords that we'll read in English understand that behind that is his name, Yehovah. In English, Jehovah. And I'm going to explain how we have that, how that came to be in a moment. I am the, the I am Yehovah, Yehovah, who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Yehovah. So let's go back to Exodus 3 because that little passage there hinted at something. I'm the one who rescued you out of Egypt. This is uh, a very important story about when Moses asks for his name. And so we're going to read this in Exodus chapter 3, Moses at the burning bush, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb. This is another name of a mountain that you know another name to. Sinai or Sinai. 
So Moses is at the mountain where the burning bush happens is at the mountain that he will bring Israel to and, and receive the commandments. It's the same mountain. Moses was there for the burning bush and he's going to go get Israel and bring them to that same mountain where the burning bush was. Sometimes we don't make that connection. Partially because this, this other name, Horeb, it's describing the same place as Sinai. Uh, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Uh, and so, again, angel of the Lord, what is this saying here? The messenger, this word angel means messenger, the messenger of Yehovah, which is a specific title. This is not just some angel. This is a Christophany, the preexistent Christ making an appearance. In other words, it is God himself, okay? And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Isn't that interesting? It's on fire, but the leaves are staying green and healthy. The fire is not burning the bush up. Think about this on the day of Pentecost when the fire fell on the apostles and it didn't consume them. And so this is a life-giving fire, not a destroying fire. And so what a marvelous sight to see. He saw the fire, but the bush is not being burned up. That's, wow, what is going on here? So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside. In other words, at first, it wasn't obvious what's going on. He saw something that caught his attention. He said, I'm going to check this out. I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. This is the first question burning in him, is how is this fire not consuming the bush? I need to go take a closer look. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, Jesus referred to this once that uh, he's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. He's a generational God. He reveals himself to generation after generation. And he's faithful to generation after generation. And they were still alive. Yes. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So who is this messenger of Yehovah? He is God. It is actually Yeshua. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. He, and he, so God is saying, I'm intimately aware of what's happening to them. I know with an intimate and thorough knowledge what is going on. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. God is a deliverer of his people out of the hand of dictators and tyrants. Woo! And he raises up new leaders. Hallelujah. And to bring them up from the land to a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Termites. <laughs> now, therefore, behold the cry 
of the children of Israel has come to me. Isn't that cool? Just right there, I mean, you could meditate on that. He's aware when people are suffering and their cry he hears. And I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Uh, some have said that the reason one of the first miracles that he's going to perform with Moses in Egypt is to turn the river Nile to blood because that's the river that they threw the babies into. In other words, it's revealing the crime. You didn't get away with it. You didn't hide the babies in the river. I saw. He exposed the sin. He exposed that crime of murder of the babies. Yes. Yes. So the, they also, the, the worship, they were polytheists. And so they worshiped the river. That, that river gave them their prosperity and their life, uh, their, their fertility uh, of, to grow the crops that they grew. And, but he says, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. I've seen everything. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Isn't this such a cool story? Boy, you could make a great movie out of this, right? <laughs> but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And so what did God say? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. In other words, when I bring you back to this mountain with the people, remember, this is the sign to you that I'm with you. And he's going to manifest his presence on this mountain in a powerful way on the first Pentecost. He's going to pour out fire and wind and languages when God speaks out of the fire. Verse 13, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, who do I say you are? <laughs> The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, Oh, really? What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, Now, this is really interesting because first he gives really a, a meaning of the name, and then he will say the name. So first it's a description. It has to do with meaning of the name. I am who I am. This is describing meaning of his name. Uh, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Lord of, uh, to the children of Israel, the Lord God, who? Yehovah. Now we have his personal name, which is connected to the explanation of the meaning of his name, which is, I will be what I will be, I am, and we're going to dive into that. But first I want you to understand, first it's the explanation, and then he gives them the name. So he says, this is what you shall say to the children of Israel, Yehovah of your fathers. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial. What is his memorial? His name. 
to Moses? Everyone. All generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. Now remember, when we do Passover, we are to see ourselves as having been in Egypt. We are to identify with Israel. And as believers in Christ, the New Testament says we're grafted in to Israel. Wild branches grafted in to the cultivated olive tree. Verse 17, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. So that land is the land where Israel has been regathered into that President Trump was the first one to recognize was the eternal capital of Israel, Jerusalem. Lots of other presidents said they would do it and they didn't do it. Then they will heed your voice and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt. And you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews, Yehovah of the Hebrews has met with us and now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So I'm going to give you this, I'm going to read this to you from the complete Jewish translation. And so Moses is in Hebrew, Moishe, uh, asked God what he was to say when the people asked what is his name. God said to Moshe, Eye, Asher, Eye. These are three verb tenses. This is the explanation, I am. Eye, Asher, Eye is I am. And it's more than that. I am what I am. And added, here is what you are to say to the people of Israel. Eye, I am, has sent me to you. God said further to Moshe, Say this to the people of Israel, Yud, He, Vav, He, Yehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, Isaac, and the God of Yaakov, Jacob, has sent me to you. And so, now, we think about a time in the New Testament in John chapter 8. This is why the Jews got really angry because of how Jesus identified himself. And so the New Testament identifies Jesus with the name. Okay? Let's go read this in John chapter 8. Let's start in verse 54. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jew said to him, You are not fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say, before Abraham was, I was. But he used this, uh, aye, I, the great I am. He identified himself with Yehovah or Jehovah. So what did they do? Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Because it wasn't time yet. So I am 
uh, and and the name so Yehovah and those three verbs are part of Yehovah. There are actually the the three tenses are the name Yehovah is built from them. So the explanation is also in the name. Okay, and I'll show you that. So the name Yehovah, which means I am also suggests to the uh, uh, suggests that uh, Yehovah exists without reference to anything or anybody else. In other words, he's the self-existent one who eternally exists and depends on nothing else and no one else. He's self-eternally existing. He's a necessary being. He's the Almighty that caused everything else to be. So his name also means he is the one who is. So of, of him saying this about himself, first thing you need to know about me is I exist. Right. Nothing caused me. I have always existed. And I cause all things to exist. He is the existing one, the eternal one. The, the, the foundational fact of God is that he exists. And so he's proving his existence even in his name. So the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has a name by which he wanted to be known and that he wanted you to know. The most holy name of God is written in Hebrew by the letters Yod, He, Vav, He, four consonants. Now in Hebrew, the vowels, it, so it's, it's, an, uh, it's a language of, especially biblical Hebrew is the language of consonants that there are vowel markers, okay? And the four letters... Yod Hey Vav Hey is what is called the Tetragrammaton, the personal name of God. And Tetragrammaton means four letters. Then the dots and stuff is the vowels, okay? So there it is. And remember, in Hebrew, we're, we're starting from the right side. So the first letter is Yod. Uh, hey. Vav, hey. God's name is made up from the three tenses of the verb, ehege. Remember, we read that when we read the complete Jewish translation. Uh, the three tenses of the verb, ehege, what, does that, what is that verb? That is the verb to be. To be or not to be. Well, God must be. And it's all tenses. In other words, the future tense is yehege, present tense is hove, and past tense is haya. All of those are in Yehovah. Yehovah is the one who was, who is, and shall come. Revelation points to this. When Jesus speaks to John, we'll go read this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. Even if some cry about it, we're still glad and happy about it. There's lots of situations we go through where some are crying, but some are shouting. <laughs> Look at this. Now he quotes what Jesus says to him. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come. He's saying the three tenses of that Hebrew verb that God spoke to Moses. When God said, say to them that I am, I was, I am, and I will be. 
Jesus is calling himself that right here. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so Jesus definitely here is saying that he is Yehovah. And so Yehovah is made up of those three tenses of the verb to be. And so its fundamental meaning is, it means to be, to exist. And it has a meaning to be known. So he is the self-existent one who makes himself known to you. He reveals himself. Our God is the God who reveals himself. Some very smart people like Anselm, the Bishop of Canterbury, like a thousand years ago, he, he worked this out. If, God, if it's possible that God exists, then God must exist. Because God, and understanding who God would be, that he's all-powerful, he's all-love, he created everything. He exists outside of the natural creation. He is the one who created everything that is. And if there is a possible world in which God exists, then God must exist because nothing else could exist without him. He is the perfect being with, about which none other greater can be thought of. If you could think of something else greater, then that would be God. But he is that which nothing greater can be conceived. He is the absolute perfect necessary being. And uh, so somebody kind of wanted to argue with him and say, okay, let's say the ultimate pizza. If the ultimate pizza could exist, then it does exist except a pizza is not necessary. It's a different category of thing. God is a necessary being. Uh, wasn't really my intention to get into that so much, but it's very much in his word that the first thing I'm, God wanted to reveal to you is that he exists. He can't not exist. It's necessary that he exists. And he exists in his perfection. He's not caused by anything. He's not dependent on anything. And so there are, there's, a, there's a difference in what kind of a being there is. There's dependent beings. There's things that depend on something else for the fact that they do exist. If you make something, if you create something, if you carve something out of a tree, it didn't have to exist. You caused it to exist. God has to exist, nothing caused him to exist. He causes everything to exist. So Jewish tradition holds that this name is so holy that it may not be uttered. Now the Bible actually says otherwise. We are to declare it. Yes, it may have been, at now so the Jews definitely would, were, were commanded to utter it. The high priest would say it, when he went to the Holy of Holies. Also, guess what? There is a priestly blessing. We're going to read that when we, when we get to it. In the text, it has his name. You were to declare his name when you said the priestly blessing. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Uh, it's trans and so it's translated, the Lord bless you and keep you, but it's really his name there. And at the end of it, he says, this is how you will place my name on the people of Israel. So to place his name on them, you actually have to say his name. Right? And uh, so another thing that Orthodox Jews will say instead of the name is an Aramaic word, which is Hashem, which means the name. So we speak of the one called the name. So even in their not saying the name, they call him the name. 
It's like the name we won't say. <laughs> but they call him the name, showing you how important the name is. Because his nickname, they call him the name. Yes. Yes. Yeah, some of the, there were, the Jesus talked about man-made rules that you've replaced God's commandments with. And, and so to, to forbid people to say the name is, is a man-made rule, not a biblical rule. The biblical rule is don't take it in vain. Don't, you know, you're to hallow it. That's the commandment. But uh, you are to say it. In fact, yes, they took it to an extreme. So kind of the Pharisaic model was to build fences around the commandments way beyond the commandment so you never even get close to breaking the commandment. Okay, but that would also bind burdens on people that God never intended and that they couldn't do. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, it hides his name. And so, so, uh, so this man, uh, let me see, uh, Nehemiah Gordon is a Karite Jew, and he has found 2,000 manuscripts where the name is actually written out, not, uh, and also he has found letters by Jewish rabbis. And so sometimes scholars will say, oh, the Jews forgot how to say it. Not true. They just keep it secret. So a rabbi will pass it to his disciple every seven years in a special ceremony. And they'll say it to the disciple. They'll pronounce it. But they do it, they, I mean, they wash themselves, they wear, they, ha, they really prepare themselves to say it. To be uh, right, to be holy, to say it. Yes, yes. Yes. So let's just, uh, so Yehovah came to Europe as Yehovah, uh, where many Europeans pronounce the J uh, like a Y. They have that. So, so in German to say, ja, jawohl, that's a J, right? Uh, but English, when it came to English speakers, we pronounced a hard J, Jehovah. So Jehovah is English, and that's fine. Just like Jesus is English, but in Hebrew, there's not that J sound. It's Yeshua, okay? And so it is translated as Lord in, in the NIV and most other English Bibles uh, and as Adonai in the complete Jewish Bible. Often in English Bibles, you'll see Lord, all, all capitals, this is translating his personal name. Sometimes it's just capital L. Uh, if you see uh, capital L, Lord, this is translating Adonai. It depends on the translation. Uh, but where the Hebrew reads, reads Adonai, uh, somebody who's reading the Hebrew scriptures will, will say, uh, well, well, when you see Adonai and then the name, they'll say Adonai Elohim. And Elohim is another name for God that's a plural name. It's in the Shema. So the, the, one of the great things every Jewish person learns, and this is what would be said over you as you're dying, Shema Israel, Yehovah Elohim, Yehovah Echad. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. That's interesting because it has three names for God in it. Yehovah, Elohim, which is plural, and Yehovah are Echad. It's a unity of a plurality. There's another word that means a singularity, and that's Yahid, a one and only one. When uh, God made Adam and Eve, and these two shall be Echad, flesh. There'll be one flesh. Echad is the word he used for the two being one. And so Yehovah Elohim 
Yehovah Echad, one. Three are one. Trinity. Okay? So when God said, let us make man in our image, Elohim. And so sometimes, though, in the, in the scriptures, it'll say, Adonai, Yehovah, and, which means Lord, but they'll say, uh, again, Adonai, Elohim, and that's written in the complete Jewish Bible. Uh, the alternative would be uh, kind of clunky to say Adonai, Adonai. Or in English, we get the Lord God. That's, that flows nicely, but we're not seeing something there. We're missing that it is his personal name. In the NIV, they translate that as the sovereign Lord. The word sovereign's not really there. Okay? It's Adonai Yehovah. And so the, the Hebrew is, uh, if, the, if you, it'll be Adonai, it'll be the word for Adonai, and then Yehovah, the, tetra, the four letters, right? And so in the best, really in English, we would translate it, the best way would be the Lord Yehovah. So when you say the Lord God, know that it's saying the Lord Yehovah. And so Yehovah is God as the eternal God that's in the meaning of his name. The God who is and was and is to come. This name identifies the living God in covenant relation to his holy people Yehovah self eternally existing and the only unique one who is so. The redemptive name of God revealed as Yehovah is God's own personal and distinct unique name. And so the name Yehovah appears in the authorized version about 6,823 times and is generally translated in English as Lord. So um, you understand then you could read a lot of verses and, and you'd read Lord, but just if you look it up, it's Yehovah. The Hebrews referred to this name as the unpronounceable or incommunicable name of God, hence the name. And again, the Hebrew letters for this name are four. The English letters, uh, English equivalent would be J-H-V-H. And the vowels are supplied by pointers. These are spoken of as being the four-letter tetragrammaton, which means the four letters. And so Yehovah is the I am that I am. It signifies to be, or and it also means, because again, the future tense is here. It means all three tenses, uh, uh, and that's what I am eternally. It's all, he always is, right? So I will be all that I will be. He's also saying. The I am is saying, I will be what I will be. Now, when, he, when we, he reveals to us and he says these redemptive compound names, he is saying to you, I will be Yehovah Rapha to you, the Lord your healer. So when they're, when they're compounded, he's saying, I'm the self-eternally existent one who is revealing to yourself, I want to be known by you as the, the Lord who heals you. That's who I am. I will be your healer. Yehovah Yireh, I will be your provider. That's how you shall know me. I'm declaring to you that's who I am to you. Mm. So there are many of these compound names in which he wants to show you and communicate to you who he is unchangingly so to you. He will be all that he has ever needed to be. These compound names are always linked with some need that he knows you have. Now remember, when he revealed that name to Moses, it was in the context of I know the need of Israel. 
I saw your sorrow. I heard your cry. I know and I have seen the oppression. And so he's revealing his name in that context of the need of his people. And so his name is the answer to the need of his people. And it's here that Yehovah will be all that his people ever need him to be. And because of his eternal self-existence as your redeemer, he will always be what you need to be for you to exist forever. No wonder he can say, you will always be with me. His own name guarantees that. And so he says of himself, Yehovah is my name. This is my memorial. In other words, you should remember it. That's what memorial means. Unto all generations. Tell every generation my name. I am all, I am your all in all. I am all you will ever need. When Abraham says, what will you give me? God says to him, I am your exceeding reward. Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 20. Therefore, lo, I am causing them to know at this time. I caused them to know my hand and my might, and they have known that my name is Yehovah. The name reveals his might. I am that I am. I will always be. I will be what I will be, okay? I'm the one who was. I'm the one who is. I'm the one who will come. As Jesus says in Revelation, he's the self-existent one revealing himself to man in his redemptive purpose to meet your need. It also means he, he, it, it's a self-existent one who reveals himself to you as your need meter. It means he causes to become. Jesus said, ask me in prayer, and if it doesn't exist, in the literal Greek, I will make it for you. I am the creator. Joshua said, okay, you know, we're beating up our enemies that you sent us to go get, but we're running out of light. Can you just hold the sun? God says, no problem. He stopped the sun. <laughs> and so when, G when Jesus says, let's feed the people, and they go, oh. <laughs> Father, thank you. And the bread and the fish just kept going because he will cause it to be the unchanging one, the existing one who causes all things to be. So this chief meaning of Yehovah is derived from the Hebrew word Hava, meaning to be or to exist. And there's three tenses, forms of that verb that are all built into his name. And it suggests to become, or specifically to become known, a God who reveals himself unceasingly. It's part of his nature to reveal himself to you. That's who he is. He can't not reveal himself. And so this name was of the utmost importance to the Jews in the Old Testament, to Moses, to Abraham, as well as to Jews today and, and everybody today because it's the proper name, the personal name that God himself chose to speak and reveal his redemptive nature and plan for mankind. Now, as we're going to get to in the wonderful name of Yeshua, 
is that's another compound name. Because, in other words, because he is Yehovah, Yeshua has a meaning too. And so I would ever stop right here, but let me just tell you, the, ga the angel Gabriel comes to Joseph and says, you shall call his name. He First he tells him, don't be concerned. This child is of the Holy Spirit, remember? And he said, you shall call his name Yeshua because he shall save his people. He said that because he's explaining the meaning of the name Yeshua. Yeshua means Yehovah saves. That Yeshua is Yehovah's salvation. That Yeshua is Yehovah saving. Wow. Yes. So God himself became a man to be your salvation. He is the one that Jehovah is saving through. The self-existent one has now become flesh. So that he could die. But then rise again. Because again, he can't not exist. And so, Yehovah is greater than death. He cannot cease. Father, we just thank you for this time. And we thank you for your word in which you've revealed yourself to us in your name. And so we're so thankful for the wonderful name of Yeshua. And that in that name, you're revealing that you are Yehovah, our Savior. That we are saved through Jesus, your Son. That he died on the cross for us he bore our sins and our shame and our death and our sickness and our separation from you that we might be brought near and have fellowship with you and to know you. You've removed everything, every obstacle of knowing you. Thank you. We bless your name, Yehovah, Yeshua. You are good, and your mercy endures forever. Amen. We love you. We bless you with the love of God and the grace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Yehovah Father, Yehovah Yeshua, Yehovah Spirit, Ruach. All right, have a great evening. So we're going to have fun, I think, in this series. Yeah, good. Have a great week.